Welcome to this week's edition of Church and State with Chris Ferrara and Brian McCall. We are recording this program today on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, uh, which is on in this year, uh, June 24th, which is also the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. And I think those feasts are really significant for what we have to talk about today. Just this morning, the Supreme Court finally issued its long-awaited opinion in the Dobbs case, considering the formerly existing claim to exist right to abortion under the U.S. Constitution. And I think it is not uh, a coincidence that this occurred on the day we honor the birth of the precursor, because this, I think, will be a precursor of things to come, and on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. What a great mercy for our country. So welcome, Chris. Let, let's let's dive in and uh, start to explain what happened today. Well, what we have with this opinion in Dobbs is a total evisceration of not only Roe versus Wade, but Planned Parenthood versus <laughs> Casey. Yes. So if you heard the oral argument uh, in the Dobbs case, you realize that the court had no choice but to rule as it did because this right to abortion really doesn't have any definable contours. There either is a right, and if so, the right is unqualified, or there is no such right, in which case Roe versus Wade cannot stand. And the court rightly concluded that there is no such right, therefore Roe versus Wade cannot stand. It's really that simple. It is really, in a certain sense, after all these decades of argument, it, it does come down to a real simple principle. Um, and, and and part of that as well that, that the prior courts just wouldn't really deal with. I, I like that the, the, the opinion of the court, it was a 6-3 decision, so six justices. Uh, and again, their names, I think, are important. Uh, Justice, the Chief Justice, John Roberts, which is a little bit of a surprise to me, I have to admit. I was worried about him. But Justice uh, Roberts, Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice Samuel Alito, who authored, was the author of this opinion. And then the three justices appointed by former President Donald Trump, Neil, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, and Brett Kavanaugh. Um, where it starts is, is well, if there's a, a right in the Constitution, where is it in the Constitution? Where's the word abortion anywhere in the Constitution? And a <laughs> fundamental point, not there. How can you have a right to something under a document that never even mentions it? Yeah, but well, then you the, go, most, they, the most they can say is that it's somewhere in the Constitution, the first, the fourth, the fifth, the ninth, the 14th Amendment, or uh, <laughs> what, what some have called great big liberty, this free-floating liberty interest lurking in the 14th Amendment. You just have liberty. It's part of liberty, or, you know, the right to do as you please. And the majority said uh, none of these points uh, for anchoring the right actually anchor a right. It, it's just not there. And there's nothing in the history or tradition of the United States that would allow it to be characterized as a right covered by what they call substantive due process. Substantive due process is this idea that not just a process in terms of procedure is a right under the Constitution. They can't take your life away without due process. But also there are actual substantial elements of liberty in the due process clause. And the test for that has always been, well, if you say that this is an element of substantive due process, that's not an enumerated right. Well, only a few rights qualify as substantive due process. Those would be rights that everybody recognizes are rooted in American history and tradition, like the right to marry. Obviously, that's something we all regard as a fundamental right, and no one would deny that the right to marry is rooted in American history. But mm -hmm. you can't just say that the right to abortion exists within this realm of substantive due process because it has no history. It's certainly not mm -hmm. rooted in American tradition that you can kill your baby in the womb. So it fails the substantive due process test. So you can't even smuggle it in under the notion of substantive due process. But as you noted in our discussion before we began, Justice Thomas in his concurrence says this whole idea of substantive due process is itself <laughs> suspect. It's a made up notion to bring in rights. Granted, these rights are fundamental, such as the right to marry mm -hmm. or the right to raise your children. That's another mm -hmm. one that's considered fundamental. But it's really a, a kind of judicial invention as well. So not even there could they find, or did the majority find a right to abort a child in the womb? Well, and to me, it's kind of like this whole, well, I must be there somewhere. As you're standing, you know, you eat a meal in a restaurant, you're standing there to go to pay. And you go, oh, wait, I have the money somewhere. Uh, is that, does that count? 
<laughs> no, right? you gotta pre- you gotta produce it. So if you if it if you can't identify where something is, then it's nowhere, right? But but you you bring up this point about history, which I think is really important because uh, Justice Alito, I think, does an excellent job going through the history, clearing away a lot of these false arguments and false narratives. And he first of all goes through all the way back prior prior to the United States existing, back to Bracton in the 13th century, saying abortion let alone not being a right, was always a crime throughout history. So how can you have a right to do something that back in the 13th century, all the way up until 1960s, was a crime universally? I mean, it's really just such a fundamental point that I, I'm glad he takes the time to trace it through. He goes through century by century, a crime, a crime, a crime. Uh, makes it clear that at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted, it was a crime in every state. So how can you have a right uh, to something that that was criminal. But here's where he gets into an important distinction. It is true that at different points in pregnancy, there were different lines drawn about when it was a felony, when it was a when it was a, a lower crime, or when the state didn't get involved to to punish it, punish it, because a lot of times the liberals jump on that and say, oh, see, abortion isn't always murder. And, and he goes through and say, but you know, the law is always drawing distinctions. You might kill someone in a, a case that's a close call, is it something criminal or is it, and, and we're going to draw the line and just say, okay, we can't quite tell here the result we don't condone, but, but the consequences, we have to draw a line. And one of the most powerful parts is he talks about the fact that um, there was this line that existed called, you know, whether the, the feet, the, the baby had quickened, could you feel that they were alive? And after that is when it was a murder. He says, but even in ca- states where, if you had an abortion performed before you could feel the baby's movement, maybe 8, 10, 12 weeks, even though it may, you couldn't be accused of murder, it was still at not a permissible act and still was criminal intent. And the example he cites is a doctor who gives a potion or a poison, something to cause an abortion to the mother and kills the mother, was considered premeditated murder. And what's interesting about that is normally that wouldn't be the case. So if a doctor gives some medicine to someone and they die and mm-hmm. they say, I wasn't intending to kill them, that they just happened to die, they can't be accused of murder, right? Even if they were negligent, they can't be accused of murder. But here he's saying there's a criminal murderous intent, right? A, a, a malicious intent in the act of giving her the poison to kill the baby. And, and, and the example is, he says, like, if I, I want to go kill, you know, Chris, so I bring my gun and I go shoot at Chris, but I miss and I kill somebody else. I can still be accused of murder of killing the somebody else, even though I didn't intend to kill them because I was trying to kill Chris. And the law he shows always showed, even in those cases, if you were intending to kill even a baby that wasn't moving yet or couldn't be felt, you were guilty of murder by transference to the mother. So again, it may seem like a detail, but I think it's important because Roe, if you read that opinion, was just horrific in its treatment of history. It just made up, and they call it out, history. And and one of the things Alito says, I need to set this record straight. So I think that was a big, big part of this. And the, and the key element in dismantling Roe was that it basically usurped a legislative function by setting up this ridiculous yes. trimester framework and, and holding that there's a constitutional right before viability to yes. uh, ch- kill your child in the womb. Now the trimester framework, as the as the majority opinion notes, was advanced by nobody in the case. Neither <laughs> side argued for a trimester framework. This was a complete judicial invention that sprang from the mind of the majority in Roe. They invented it on the spot when no party had advocated for it, and it's really in the nature of legislation. So th- that case stands out as a total anomaly in the history of Supreme Court jurisprudence yes. on the existence of constitutional rights. And in terms of the viability standard and how one, at common law, quickening was the standard for determining whether a felonious uh, murder had occurred, the, the majority is at pains to note that the fact that they drew the line at viability in, in certain criminal statutes doesn't mean that the state didn't think it had the right to prohibit abortion from mm-hmm. the moment of conception. And right. the fact that something isn't prohibited explicitly doesn't mean there's a constitutional right to do it. Right. So there, there's a, a leap in logic that wasn't justified also. You know, at, at, when, at the end of the analysis, 
all the proponents could say was reliance, reliance. Everybody relied on this decision for 50 years, but the majority disposed of the reliance argument as yes. well. Uh, <laughs> Brilliantly, and, I think, yes. And in terms of reliance, well, if, if you're still relying on the right to abortion, then just go drive to a state where it's still legal to murder your child in the womb, because there will always be such states. All the court has done here is to return this question to the states for determination by legislative action as a matter for legislation, which in itself reveals a fundamental flaw in our system, doesn't it? Mm. But at least the at yes. least the error is being transmitted to a level of government that responds to the popular will, which is better than having five judges out of nine determine the fate of millions of lives in the womb. That's over now. Yes, that that is definitely over now. And again, for anybody who tries, it is, it is the most clear language that the they say the Constitution contains no right to abortion. And again, you know, and, but, then, but then you get to the Roberts concurrence, which I find to be completely ridiculous. Yeah, because Roberts Roberts says he refuses to admit that, that there is no such right. He continues to insist that somewhere in the Constitution there is this right to abortion, but he won't tell us what the scope of this right is. It's just that there's this right, and he agrees that the viability test is wrong. That should be discarded. You can't just draw the line at viability. So then where would you draw the line? Roberts isn't going to tell us. He's just going to say, well, there's a right to abortion, and I don't know what the limits of it are, but we shouldn't have gone this far. Send me another case, and maybe I'll tell you then what the, what the limits on the right to abortion are. But I'm not telling you now. It's right. just this right, this inchoate right, the limits of which – well, we'll just prolong the agony for another generation to yep. figure out what the limits are until we get to zero. But the, the majority said it already is zero. There is no such right. Yes. No, exactly. Because, again, the Mississippi law at issue here banned abortion after 15 weeks. Roberts, again, he voted to say, yes, that law is OK. Uh, but I don't know about 14 weeks. Bring me 14 weeks. Then bring me yeah. 13. Then bring me 12. I mean, it, it, it. and I'm so glad that none of the other justices fell for his scheme, which would have just prolong the inevitable for who knows. Oh, yeah. And, and by the way, he says in his concurrence, Roberts does, that he's not sure about whether you could prohibit abortion after the moment of conception. Oh, well, yeah. that's great. So there's this right to abortion, and he's not sure if <laughs> it ceases to exist at conception, in which case there can be no abortions. But right. he'll let us know later on at some point in the future. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a totally unprincipled opinion. Yeah, it is. Well, he basically it, it, just refuses to let go of this yeah. groundless idea that there's a right to abortion. But but again, his concurring opinion is of no legal effect. The the opinion of the right. court is the opinion that that says there's no right to abortion. It's right. just his sort of little protest. I wouldn't have done so much. Which again is it, he gets to say it, but it it is not the law. What he says is clear. But you another know, important you, the point of this ahead. that I think you touched on there. Is you mentioned this absurd viability legislative standard that they just made up. Well, Casey had already thrown that out. The problem is what they put in was another absurdity that in teaching law, I know, notice the students can never understand because it's another absurdity. So Casey threw out viability to say, okay, there's a right to abortion. You can regulate it as long as it's not an undue burden. You can have a due burden, <laughs> you know. And and you know it's it, it was an invention of a legal standard that has no that is not a standard that means nothing and it basically means you can regulate abortion for anything we decide in another case we think is okay based on no criteria and no, thank no. goodness thank goodness they got rid of that because that could have applied to who knows what else they could have oh let's grab the undue burden standard they it's throw the whole standard the, out it's even worse than the trimester framework you know. What is an undue burden? It's a burden that's undue, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, since this is church and state, maybe yes. we can segue into uh, the implications of this decision in terms yes. of the church. So uh, what we have now is a situation in which the question of abortion will be turned over to the majority, which is obviously preferable to having five justices decide the fate of lives in the womb. But now it's a process for democracy to determine. Let the yes. people decide. Well, that's the adjudication of Pontius Pilate. Yes. Let, the crowd tell, let the crowd tell me whether I should execute Jesus or the, the morality of the Colosseum. Thumbs up and the person is spared and thumbs down and the person is executed. 
Actually, uh, it was actually the other way around, by the way. If it was thumbs up, the person was executed. <laughs> so, so it's the morality of the Coliseum, that, which is now at work. And maybe in most states that will produce substantial, if not total, restrictions on this imaginary right to kill your child in the womb. But what's the problem here? The problem here is that we have the paradigm of democracy. You and I have been discussing the thought mm. of Giorgio Agamben, the Italian political philosopher and literary critic. Yes who says in a, uh, in a conclusion that a liberal critic of his calls intoxicating, that the hidden paradigm of democracy is the concentration camp, well, by which he means that in these democracies, mm. you are given rights, but the rights are just conventions that can be revoked at will, as we saw with the COVID regimes. And mm -hmm. Agamemnon talks about this state of exception in which the duly elected executive, the governor, the president, the premier, whatever, if you're talking about Canada, uh, decides to exercise the state of exception through emergency powers. And he says to the people, well, you elected me and I'm your representative and I exercise emergency powers. So even there, the people have decided by giving me these powers. So all of this devolves into what the majority wants. And this is the mm -hmm. fundamental problem with political modernity and the Western democracies in particular. And what is the ultimate solution? to this endless debate over what rights are and what right and wrong are mm -hmm. in political society. Well, we know as Catholics, yes. there's only one solution, which is the organic relationship between church and state, which mm. provides a check on the power of the state such that the state cannot exceed certain bounds in its enactments without opposition by the church as an intermediary body between the power of the sovereign and the individual citizen who in our society stands naked and exposed, possessed of only one vote in the next election. <laughs> no, very true. And again, that, that essentially here I have some footage outside the Supreme Court. So now this is who it's turned over to. The mob. Uh, over to, I like the mob. Uh, as you said, I like that justice of Pontius Pilate. And, and that's the, the, the fundamental problem here that, you know, our society thinks that individuals – or acting together can somehow decide what's right and what's wrong rather than the natural and divine law. And so again, it, it's a good decision in that it took away from the oligarchy that had just forced immorality on us. And 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 what the popes I think have always said is obviously the right answer is the the, the Christian state, the the, the uh, reign of Christ the King, that you would not uh, have this flawed liberty. But until that is achieved. We obviously have to, in prudence, do whatever's possible within the circumstances God puts us to ameliorate the effects of the evil secular liberal world and advance Christ the King. So we don't just say, oh, well, they threw it back to the states. Oh, well, nothing we can do about it. That's bad. Now is the time when Catholic action has to be called upon. And you know, to be examined, I think the congressional election in November may be one of the most critical in modern history, because what the Democrats will want to do is use the supremacy clause that federal law overcomes state law and attempt to pass a statute, a federal law that says every person in this country has a right to abortion and we preempt any state laws that, that criminalize it. If they did that, they would try to impose in something easier to overturn than a Supreme Court decision, but still impose abortion on the states. And again, I think we have to keep in mind that this system is flawed, but we have to work while it's here within it to prevent an outcome such as that. Well, we're not out of, out of the woods precisely because yes. of that possibility. If Congress yes. did adopt such legislation, sure, it would be dead on arrival with the current majority. But God forbid one of the conservative justices dies yes. and between now and the 2024 presidential election and Biden gets to appoint another liberal. Well, then it's five to four the other way. And that very statute, if enacted by Congress, would be upheld. Mm -hmm. And so the fundamental problem of democracy constantly resurfaces. And it's always a struggle over whether the given electorate is going to be tilted mm -hmm. one way or the other. Now, Pope Leo, as you rightly point out, says we have a duty, nevertheless, to use the mechanisms of democracy yes. and the cankered, cankered liberties, as he calls them. Yes. <laughs> as long as we don't violate our conscience in doing so. In order to bring back what he calls the form and pattern of Christianity to society, 
And, you know, I, I would conclude with thoughts uh, that were uttered by none other than John Courtney Murray in his book, We Hold These Truths, where he finally admits to the fundamental problem. And this is someone who defended the American model as mm -hmm. nothing short of divinely inspired. Apparently he was chastened toward the end of his career. And, and, and in, at the, in the concluding chapters of, of We Hold These Truths, he says the following, that the modern state has declared the Galatian doctrine. That's the doctrine enunciated by Emperor Galatius, that there are two powers, the temporal and the spiritual. And the spiritual holds sway over the temporal, has declared the Galatian doctrine to be heretical and has outlawed it in the name of modern orthodoxy, which is a naturalist rationalism. Then he goes on to say that uh, political modernity has, quote, rejected the freedom of the church as the armature of men's spiritual freedom <laughs> and as a structural principle of a free society. I repeat a structural principle of a free society because the power of the church to keep sovereignty at bay, to keep it from enacting immoral legislation is essential to the protection of the people from what we see in decisions like Roe versus Wade, the total abandonment of the natural law. And finally, he concludes that the modern nation state has quote, denied or ignored or forgotten or neglected the Christian revelation that man is sacredness and that his primatial raised sacra, his freedom is sought and found ultimately within the church. That's, <laughs> and, and then the author wow. Kenneth Craycraft, Kenneth Craycraft asks of this, what else can Murray be talking about but the United States of America and its political and legal institutions? Now, in, yes. in this book I wrote, Liberty of the God that Failed, I, I note there was a movement of conservative Protestants in the 1860s who were saying exactly the same thing. Unless the kingship of Christ is recognized in America, not that we would have a theocratic state, we would have separate spheres, the political and mm. the spiritual, but the kingship of Christ would put a break on the excesses of political power and prevent mm. the enactment of decisions like Roe. Unless we have that, then America would become, as these Protestants predicted, a Christless, godless blank. Yes. Which is what yes. we had. Very, very true. That's I haven't heard that quote from Mary before. That that is really surprising uh, from John Courtney Murray. But but it's uh, common it's sense, very, though, because if Christ is. came to bring yes. his truth to the world, and if Christ tells us that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if his teaching is to be followed by all men and all nations, then it follows that nations are just as obliged to do to do what is right and to refrain from wrongdoing, and that the law of the gospel applies to nations as well as individuals. And at least yes. it, to the extent of the natural law, which binds all men, even atheists, are yes. bound by the natural law expressed in the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Yes. Yes, very true. Well, maybe to wrap up this program, again, there's a lot to talk about. I, maybe we can end it a little bit on a personal note. Um, you, you, Chris, in your legal career, you spent a lot of your time defending uh, people who were fighting against abortion, attempting to persuade women not, not to engage in this, to pray outside abortion clinics. Uh, going back, I mean, decades you've been doing this work. Back in those early days when you were defending some of those early pro-life warriors, did you ever think that this day would come? And what is that? How does it make you feel today to see it finally come? I never, I never thought I'd see the day. Uh, I, I thought it would ha would require a constitutional amendment, which was very unlikely ever to be passed. And mm. you know, so much for the argument, by the way, that it doesn't matter who you vote for in presidential elections. <laughs> Obviously, yes. if yes. Trump had not been elected, this would not have happened. And this is a sea change in American legal history and the history and world legal history as well. We can now argue in all of these cases that I'm handling involving the rights of pro-lifers to advocate for life, that there is no constitutional right to abortion, <laughs> that the yes. Freedom of Access to Clinics Entrances Act does not protect any constitutional right any yes. longer and never really did because there is no such right. So now we're just dealing with a statutory right. And mm -hmm. now, by the way, an attack on the Freedom of Access to Clinics Entrances Act which is used to persecute pro-lifers who demonstrate outside abortion clinics is all the more viable since the mm -hmm. underlying non-existent constitutional right has been exposed as such. 
So now mm. I think it's time to go after face. Yes. No, very true, because it is an act that's in, in, interfering with an actual constitutional right, the right to assemble in free speech. Uh, and it's not, therefore, a constitutional right against constitutional right. It's exactly. A, There's nothing it's, to balance anymore. No. The only constitutional no. rights in the equation are our rights as advocates for life. Yes. Very true. So, and I agree. I throughout my, I never thought I'd see this day. <laughs> no. Well, and, and that's why they had to get rid of Trump. You know, and, and you know, they 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 dismiss yes. him as to quote Ann Coulter, a, a cretinous flim flam artist, <laughs> which is precisely why people like Ann Coulter are worse than the liberals, because they pretend yes. to be conservatives, but they're really part of the same establishment they profess to loathe. He was no cretin, and he was no flim flam artist. He delivered on his promises, and one of the promises yeah. was he would deliver a Supreme Court majority that would reverse Roe versus Wade, and it's precisily because. This so-called flim flam artist was so successful at yes. exposing the so-called Republicans as the incompetence and cowards that they are, that they had to get rid of them, with the rhinos mm -hmm. leading the charge, the Republicans in name only. Yes, yes. No, it's very true. And again, whatever you think of Donald Trump, whatever maybe policies you disagreed with, uh, you know, at and whatever judgment he's going to face, he will be able to say you know, but for me, this would not have happened. And that we have to give him credit for that. There are these three justices, uh, their votes really determined this outcome. And yeah, we Trump have got, and speaking of church and state, Trump accomplished what the all but feckless American hierarchy would never have accomplished. No, <laughs> I mean, Roe versus Wade would not have lasted a year if the bishops had led mass protests in the streets along the lines of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. If the bishops had led thousands of people to the doorways of abortion mills and barricaded yes. the doorways in the manner of the civil rights movement, the, yes. the right could not have stood against street activism led by the Catholic Church. But that didn't happen. The church has been decommissioned as the armature of freedom, to allude again to what John Courtney Murray called the church. So we, mm -hmm. we, needed, we needed a Protestant politician who's been married yes. three times to accomplish <laughs> what the Catholic hierarchy could not. Wow. Well, again, I think to end positively, too, I, I mentioned it being the, the birth of St. John the Baptist traditionally celebrated on this day. A and I do really think this may be a turning point, point for our country and our world. Um, I think, again, it's not coincidental that it happens on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And, you know, abortion has been such a plague crying out to God for heaven. And it will not end completely. But this certainly removes at least the lie that it's a, a right, a fundamental right. And it also certainly will reduce the numbers of abortion significantly. To oh, dramatically. Many, many states will now just totally ban them. If I have to say half yes. the states will enact at least. total bans or near total bans, which basically would eliminate abortion in those states. People will cross state lines and get yes. their abortions anyway if they're determined to kill their children in the womb. Yes. But it's a great day for the right, the cause of right. And it, it shows that the Holy Ghost is at work even within the ruins of yes. these Western democracies that are tottering to their yes. fall, as Pius XI said in Ubi Arcano Day. Hey, very true. And I might just throw out again, without opening the debate on whether Pope Francis's consecration <laughs> satisfied our lady's request, I still will say at least whatever it was, even if it didn't, this may be the first fruit of that of that act of the most unlikely person. That our this may be a grace granted by our lady for our world as a, again a precursor eventually at some point to the establishment of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. So we really don't lose hope. All those people who've prayed for 40, 50 years that this day would come. You know, God's time is not our time. This was a blink to God, this amount of time. Uh, and we keep it as a reminder not to lose faith when praying. That uh, may be taking longer than we think, but God will answer our prayers because they were answered today. Yes, and as Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. And we can be sure that God's grace was at work in this decision. Yes, definitely. Well, there we have an exciting show for today. Uh, thank you for, for watching. And uh, I doubt our next show will be as momentous, but I'm sure we'll have some stories to talk about in a couple of weeks. So congratulations, Chris, on all your work that's uh, you know been part of leading up to this. And uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Take care. God bless.